Excellencies, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start the second part. It's uh, fantastic to see how much uh, conversation, discussion, and uh, cooperation, hopefully, is starting from the, this first part. And it's um, also great to see that we can be all together in this second part. At, uh, at the end of the day, thanks to technology and the innovation, uh, we can be together and uh, we will have people here in the room, others joining us online and still having a lively discussion. During this session, a panel of leading experts in industrial development matters will discuss the future of industrial policy. We will explore how to foster industrial development for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and specifically SDG 9 on industry innovation and infrastructure. Following the panel discussion, we will, have, we will open the door for your questions, and to participate, just in case, uh, to participate, you can use the Q&A um, segment on your Zoom um, screen. You can see the instructions in the chat at the bottom of the screen. And of course, we look forward to your active participation. I am sure that already by now, many of you would have something to say, to comment, and to ask. And uh, one of the things that we have seen it is, and that what you said, uh, Mr. Sachs, at the end of the, your speech, it was uh, the need of this multilateral coming together. And it is my pleasure to present the panel um, that we will be uh, talking with. And it is Ms. Jo Gosh from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, the chairperson of the Center for Economic Studies and Planning. Mr. Richard kozul Wright, director of the Globalization and Development Strategies Division as, at UNCTAD. Mr. Carlos Lopez, professor at the University of Cape Town and former executive secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Mr. Wilson Paris, former advisor to the Executive Secretariat at the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Jeffrey Sachs, the Director of the Center for Sustainable Development. And Mr. Tsiong Yung Zhu, from the Deputy to the Director General and Managing Director, Director of Technical Cooperation and Sustainable Industrial Development. But we, to continue on this, we have two pre-recorded sessions uh, that we will now show and the first one is from Ms. Mariana Mazzucato, who is professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at the University College London and founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And the second one will be by Ms. Eline Ardadotter, who is the director of the OECD Development Center. Let us start with the message of Ms. Mazzucato. <laughs> Hello there, I am Mariana Matsukato. I'm a professor in the economics of innovation at Public Value at University College London, where I founded and direct the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And indeed those words, innovation and public purpose are what I wanna talk about. How do we have a purpose-oriented industrial strategy? How do we move away from the old industrial strategies, which might just be lists of key sectors, uh, strategic sectors that countries wanted to support, and they supported those sectors to basically just stay in place. How do we put purpose at the center so the sectors that are supported have to change, they have to transform. And it's not just the sectors that have to transform, but the relationship between the public and private actors uh, and how they engage with those different sectors. And the best way to do this, I believe, is to start with the sustainable development goals. These are, as everyone knows, 17 goals with 169 targets. And one of the reasons I believe that we haven't been able to actually move steadily to achieve them is they haven't actually been embedded precisely in our industrial strategies and our innovation policies. So something I've been advocating for a while is for a mission-oriented approach to industrial strategy. And the idea is to actually use the sustainable development goals as challenges beneath which we need to really think of the moonshots of the future. So whether they're the ones around climate with net zero regions, whether they're the ones around uh, equity and reducing inequality, for example, by reducing the digital divide to zero, so every single child has equal access 
to their human right to education during the next lockdown, because we will have more lockdowns if we continue to uh, treat our, our, our planet as we are. But viruses will come our way as the permafrost melts. Hopefully this will stop, but we're not currently on track for that to stop. So when we do have another perhaps virus like COVID, we have to make sure that we don't have what we had last time, which was children, students locked in their homes, without access to digital uh, uh, technologies, without access to the internet, without access to strong broadband. So that would require a zero digital divide strategy, uh, which of course would need to bring lots of different sectors together in the same way that climate change is not just about renewable energy, it's about changing how we produce. So the materials of production, how we move, what we eat, in the same way that the moon landing in the 60s was not just about aerospace, it required lots of innovation in sectors as different as nutrition, materials, electronics, software. This is true for any sort of purpose-oriented, mission-oriented industrial strategy. So this is really my, my, my key message to UNIDO in this important event that you're having. Uh, we need industrial strategies that are not lists of random sectors, but that are really ambitious moonshots and missions that bring all our different sectors together, not through subsidies and guarantees, which just allow them to stay in place, but to really transform. And uh, I've been recently actually advising different governments on how to bring conditionality uh, to the center, for example, of loan programs, whether they are from a public bank or bailout programs, how can we make sure that these levers that governments have or procurement policy are actually conditional on moving, really steering our economy to become more inclusive and sustainable. And there's interesting examples for um, in the United States right now with the CHIPS Act, where the support being given to semiconductor companies is conditional on them paying workers their, uh, their living wage uh, to transform supply chains in a green direction, to limit share buybacks. These, of course, are all being negotiated right now. But this is a good example of how we can transform uh, levers that in the past were just support to sectors to actually be support that helps to direct our economy in a more inclusive and sustainable way. And the way, of course, the international community can, can really help make this happen is to make sure that, first of all, we always remind ourselves about the sustainable development goals, use them as the challenges that help to direct our economies, negotiate, however, locally and regionally, what that looks like in specific places in terms of those moonshots, because that can't be handed down top down, but also to really make sure that our development finance institutions and these international finance in institutions uh, really put these priorities and these uh, moonshots at the center of how we bring together different stakeholders uh, around uh, new forms of finance. So thank you so much. It's been an honor to speak to you. Thank you for the message, uh, Mr. Matsukato, and really uh, bringing all sectors together as one and the purpose-driven industrial policy strategy. And now we will hear the message of Mrs. Um, Anna Dottir um, uh, from the OECD. Distinguished Ministers, Director General of UNITO, Mr. Gerd Müller, Ambassadors, I am pleased to address you here at the 2023 edition of the UNITO Multilateral Industrial Policy Forum. Please let me begin by saying that the topic we are discussing today is of great interest to me. In my previous role as Minister of Industry in my country, Iceland, interlinking industry with environmental sustainability and innovation was a key priority. And I've seen firsthand the importance of good policies, policies that enable industrial development and innovation and mobilize private investment. I understand from my colleagues that many of you who are on this panel today were present when the Development Center launched its report on industrial policies in a shifting world in 2014. At that time, we recalled that when done well, Industrial policies can be important tools to help kickstart industrialization processes. We also recognize that implementing them successfully is very challenging and that accountability and transparency are key. 
As a follow-up to that work, we partnered with UNITO and UNCTAD and developed a policy framework to support governments in designing and implementing effective policies to transform their economies. This tool is called Production Transformation Policy Reviews, and since then, we have tested and implemented it in several countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And I want to take this opportunity here today to thank UNIDO for the great collaboration we're having on this front. I have been asked to share my views on two important issues today. First, how can national and international priorities be aligned? And secondly, how to strengthen regional integration between developing countries. Let me begin with the first question on aligning national and international priorities. To me, the most important point here is that we cannot think of industrial development without recognizing the global green imperative. We need to shift how and what we produce and make it green and compatible with our planet and its limits. Multilateral cooperation will be key, and it will require broadening the discussion to energy policies. We all know that reliable access and the supply of energy is crucial to any industrial activity. To take electricity as an example, high-income countries have an average consumption per capita of about 9,000 kilowatt hours per year. Much of this goes to industrial activity, of course. In low-income countries, annual per capita consumption is just 200 kilowatt hours. In lower middle income countries, it's 1100 kilowatt hours. And in upper middle income countries, it's 4600 kilowatt hours. The gaps are evident and will need to get filled if continuous industrial development is to happen. We must find ways to make sure that this expansion will be green and avoid low carbon technology traps for developing countries. Now turning to the second question on regional integration. At the OECD, we are developing a new strategy for and with Africa. We are working with the Africa Union Commission to support Africa, realizing its ambitions of industrialization, leveraging the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. But translating trade integration into industrialization and regional integration of value chains is by no means automatic. To make it work, it's essential to align policies, regulations, and mechanisms to facilitate business operations across borders. This includes items such as business registration and reporting rules, standards and certifications for products, but also infrastructure and connectivity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by emphasizing the importance of spaces for policy dialogue and knowledge sharing to help countries succeed in these endeavors. This is why I believe that the OECD Development Center and our initiative for policy dialogue on global value chains and production transformation remains a key forum, just like today's UNIDA multilateral forum. We look forward to continuing collaborating with UNIDO on these important matters, and I thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much for this message coming from EAS OECD Development Center, and uh, we have now the go into the uh, discussion, um, and these are in, in, useful insights that we have in the background, and now uh, we will discuss two points. One will be about the diagnostic and implic implication of recent development around industrial policy for developing countries. And the second one will address the role of the global community and this forum regarding the topics under discussion. Um, and let, uh, again, let me remind you that you will be able to ask questions, so please do. Um, we will start with you, Mr. Sachs, uh, Professor Sachs, being here with me. Um, let me start this. Um, um, the pressing challenge currently confronting the world is climate change. Several industrial development programs proposed around the world are built around this challenge. Professor Sachs, in your opinion, would potential gains from these programs be enough? Maybe it would be uh, useful <coughs> to outline uh, the main 
issues of the transformation very quickly uh, and then ask yes. how to accomplish this. There have now been uh, hundreds of studies of what the decarbonization transformation should entail. And they all come to basically the same point, and that is the following. For every country, the power system, that is electricity, needs to be essentially zero carbon. This is the starting point for all successful transformations. Whether you choose wind, solar, nuclear, doesn't change. The basic point is a power grid that is essentially zero carbon, zero emissions. <clears throat> Second is the uh, transformation of transport to electricity. This is very clear that the main transformation ahead for land vehicles will be to electric and uh, that will be part of everybody's challenge for most countries that don't produce vehicles. You have to have charging stations for those countries that are involved in the electric vehicle supply chain or in an automotive supply chain, there needs to be a rapid retooling. Third, buildings, if you're in a cold climate, will be heated electrically rather than by burning on site coal, oil, or gas. Uh, cooking will be primarily electric rather than gas cooking. And finally, will be industrial transformation. And industrial transformation to zero emissions will come in two main ways. One is through electrification of some parts of the industrial processes as opposed to on-site fossil fuel burning. And the second is the transformation of fuels from fossil fuels to hydrogen. So we'll definitely have a hydrogen economy alongside the electrification. This is the core of the transformation that we're going to see within the next 25 years. Maybe in 20 years, fusion will be uh, something that will become commercially actually possible and interesting. But for the next 25 years, it's going to be wind, solar, hydro, nuclear as the options and making a zero carbon system based on electrification and hydrogen, green hydrogen produced with zero carbon electricity. My basic advice to any country is you're going to need a lot more electricity in the future than you produce now. It's got to be green. Make a plan for a massive expansion of green electrons. My second point, which I emphasized earlier, is do it with your neighbors. You cannot do this on your own. Even the United States needs Mexico and the U.S. and Canada. We need, I'm from New York City, we're going to be living on Canadian hydropower. And the American Southwest should be importing Mexican sunshine for sure. And every other country in the room needs neighbors. China needs Mongolia next door. The great wind <clears throat> and solar power potential. In fact, the whole Northeast Asian system should be a grid connecting Japan, China, Korea, and so forth. And China has a fantastic uh, uh, project called GuideCo, the Global Energy uh, Global Energy Interconnection Development Cooperation Organization, which is the China state grid showing how to make large scale interconnections across national boundaries. So work with your neighbors on this. For industrial policy, there are two issues. One, how to make the transformation I just said. And then second, how to produce some of the components of that transformation because many countries have strategic minerals that can become part of the battery supply chain and can produce in those countries the batteries. 
we should have photovoltaic cells produced all over the world you need sand and technology for that it can be done in a lot of places and this is extremely important because the biggest growth sector numerically will be solar power worldwide and it should be produced with low cost cutting edge technologies china has some great technologies other countries have great technologies but all over the world so countries should ask where do we fit into the production side not only the energy transformation side there's a big problem though for half the world that is the low income and lower middle income countries the interest costs are too high to be able to finance this transformation because renewable energy is very capital intensive compared to fossil fuel energy with fossil fuel energy you pay the bill every year with solar you pay the bill up front in other words you make your investment then the sunshine comes free for 20 years but with coal you buy the coal each year so if you look at the time profile of fossil fuel based energy it's not so capital intensive you're paying in the future but for solar or wind you're paying up front so the capital costs are the big costs and the problem for half the world is the interest rates are far too high this is my department of international finance it's a big set of questions. Basically, the world is unfair. If you're rich, you pay low interest rates. If you're poor, you pay high interest rates. It's almost as simple as that. That's even how the credit rating agencies work. If you're a small, poor country, they say you're a lousy credit risk. And if you're a big, rich country, they say you're no credit risk. And so you poor countries pay 10 to 15% interest rates whereas the rich countries pay two percent interest rates so this is a big challenge and it's why programs like china's belt and road initiative are so important because that's a way to finance large-scale transformation and we should be applauding such initiatives and actually scaling them up so on the answer are we doing enough <laughs> we're not even close to doing enough because very few countries have scaled programs of transformation low and middle income countries essentially cannot afford this especially low income and lower middle income countries there are 50, 82 of them only 79 do not have credit ratings of credit worthiness investment grade 79 are sub investment grade out of the 82 low income and lower middle income countries so this transformation does not have a finance mechanism yet and for that we need official finance whether it's belt and road whether it's uh, the multilateral development banks the asia infrastructure investment bank the asian development bank and so forth these are the critical tools that we should be expanding dramatically final point i would make sorry to go on so long but final point i would make your country needs a plan a plan is not a nationally determined contribution that you submit to the unf triple c that's a 10-year uh, forecast a plan should be a quarter century because this transformation will require all the period up to 2050 your country needs a plan to 2050 how many governments have a plan not very many the united states no plan for example because politicians don't like that kind of long-term commitment it's too dangerous for them politically but there's no way to make this transformation without a long-term plan. So please try it out. Give a call if you want some uh, suggestions, but you need a long-term plan.
plan that says by 2050, this is what our energy system will look like. And then from there, you can integrate the different components of policy, budget, uh, guidance, regulation, parastatal investment, and so forth to fit within that framework. Without a plan, it's all improvisation, and we will get as far as we've gotten so far, which means not very far. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Uh, definitely, we didn't get that far. And isn't it the issue with the long-term planning that everything is about the quarterly result at the end of the day, yep. be it in the business economics and also on many uh, other segments? But, Mr. Um, I would like to to call now the, for Mr. Um, Causal Wright, um, who will then um, talk to about the latest trade and development report for NUNC that argued against the continuation of business as usual, as Mr. Um, Jeffrey just said, policy making with a strong role of central banks and austerity in public spending in the rich world. The question is, do the industrial policy actions of developed countries in the last five years signal a change in the way of thinking? And how should industrial policy change in the future how should we change it as a policy uh, in the future not to reinforce the business as usual scenario? Mr. Kozel Wright. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Unido for the invitation. I have to say it's it's going to be a little, it's a bit of an envious task following Jeff and Marianne because I suspect I'm going to say a lot of what they've uh, already said. But I guess in direct answer to your question, the answer is um, they do reflect a shift, I think, over the last five years. But it's important to recognize that advanced economies never really abandoned industrial policy, even as neoliberal ideology took over, as financialization and deindustrialization uh, reshaped their economic uh, structures. So I guess the question is as much about um, how deep and how lasting the changes that we've seen over the last uh, five years will prove. Um, and given the challenges that, that Jeff has just laid out amongst uh, other challenges that certainly need uh, industrial policy to, uh, to, to be effective. Um, I think part of the problem, of course, is the notion of industrial policy. We know that um, it's been easy to dismiss industrial policy in the past uh, as a strategy of picking winners and to identify failures that have taken place um, in terms of in terms of um, industrial policy, that's of course a little bit mis misleading. Um, as I said, industrial policy has already or always been used in advanced economies, uh, defense uh, spending, uh, the uh, the defense uh, in, uh, complex has always been uh, a source of industrial policy. Um, if you look at more recently uh, the use of intellectual property, which has been an instrumental part of the of the neoliberal agenda, has always favoured certain sectors and within those sectors uh, certain firms. The use of industrial policy uh, to address regional development uh, challenges has always been part of the advanced uh, country policy agenda. They've always targeted, they've always picked or reinforced winners. Uh, that's not a very helpful way of thinking about uh, the challenges around industrial policy. In the work that we've done, I have to say particularly from the East Asian example, we find the distinction between passive and active industrial policy a little bit more helpful, where the former passive industrial policy essentially accepts existing structures and looks at strategies that would mainly reduce the cost of doing business uh, with existing businesses, often though linked to the, I, the idea of attracting foreign capital uh, as a key component of industrial strategy on the grounds that somehow the uh, various advantages that multinational corporations can bring to an economy will automatically spill over uh, to other parts of the economy. The record is not particularly uh, uh, stellar in, in, in those terms, but that notion of a passive industrial policy has always been there in advanced economies. I think the more the notion of a more active industrial policy um, 
does target much deeper changes in economic uh, structures and economic uh, behavior. Um, and I think some of the things that Jeff just talked about in the context of climate change clearly requires a more active industrial industrial policy. From a trade angle, which is something that UNCTAD obviously um, uh, adopts, I guess this is a distinction uh, between a focus on specialization and static efficiency as compared to diversification, learning, and more uh, uh, dynamic efficiencies. I think that's a kind of common distinction that you might find in the literature. These are often see, seen as opposing uh, positions. You'll get the, the distinction between import substitution industrialization versus export oriented industrialization the uh, as, as somehow alternatives but when you look at the east asian examples for example of course they use both of these types of policies as part of a, a transformative strategy and and i think that's that 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 richer approach is something that uh, all countries both developed and developing countries need to uh, adopt and, and and move forward around one of the important lessons we certainly took from the east asian experience and i think is missing from a lot of the industrial policy discussion is the importance of corporate strategy to industrial policy and particularly the links between profit and investment uh, a, a dynamic economy is one in which profits are reinvested in uh, existing businesses rather than being used for buying back shares or or um, paying out dividends or whatever and i think that story is missing from a lot of industrial policy discussions and needs to be brought back in uh, to the conversation in that context and we've insisted on this in untad that makes rents a very important part of the industrial policy na narrative uh, creating and distributing rents which is often seen as a negative in conventional economic uh, uh, disciplines because of a highly stylized view of what a perfect, perfectly competitive economy is. But actually managing rents is a very important part of the industrial policy story. And we saw a lot of that in the East Asian uh, context, both, both as a tool to boost capital formation, but also as an incentive to shift economies into new areas uh, of production. And finally, and I, I guess just this is to reinforce the point that Jeff said, a third element in the successful industrial policy and moving beyond business as usual is the need for industrial policy to be consistently uh, developed alongside a macro financial policy. You can't do good industrial policy in the context of ultra tight monetary policy and austerity. So you need to find a way of integrating macro policy uh, with industrial policy around and I, I think i would endorse jeff's last point around the notion of planning again another dirty word from the last from the last 40 years uh, but needs to be brought back into the conversation this is not about central planning a la the soviet union uh, uh, post uh, second world war um, but it is about strategic planning and it is in the particularly in the context of developing countries the need to link industrial policy to the idea of a developmental state which is something that we have tried to do in the work that we've done with UNCTAD and with the uh, 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 OECD uh, Development Center that was mentioned uh, uh, previously. Um, so in, in terms of, of what, what we need to do more of, uh, I think both in developed and developing uh, countries uh, to, to uh, break away from business as usual and, and address the multiple problems that we're facing, I would guess Consultation is incredibly important when you're doing effective uh, industrial policy, creating the platforms that allow for effective consultation between the state, uh, between state and business, uh, but of course also between state business and labor is, 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 is crucial. Um, public investment, public procurement needs to be uh, uh, put centrally in the industrial policy agenda uh, critical in the success stories from the developing world but also i think from the developed world and i i would just say also a willingness which again is a has been missing from a lot of the discussion and it's where many developing countries have fallen short a willingness to develop uh, to discipline uh, capital um part of you you cannot 
give subsidies and, and carrots to uh, your businesses uh, and expect the results to be automatically positive. You have to be willing to discipline uh, businesses that receive government support but don't deliver on the expectations of that support. And what Alice Amsden a long, long time ago called reciprocal control mechanisms to be able to make sure you not only encourage business but also are willing to discipline business, I think is a critical part of any sort of successful uh, industrial policy strategy. Let me leave it there. Thank you very much for your very insightful um, uh, comment, uh, Mr. Cousin Wright, and it's uh, definitely yes. And um, of the national planning and in general, the passive and active industry policy and the willingness to discipline capital. Well, we would need that. Uh, we'll, I would like to go um, move forward to Professor Lopez and uh, we go to Africa as one of the regions that is lagging the most in terms of industrial development and the, the gap risks to widen as we have heard. So, Mr. Uh, Professor Lopez, what policies are needed both on the side of Africa and industrial, industrialized countries to support an acceleration of Africa's industrialization? Professor Lopez. Well, thank you very much, and thanks, Unido, for, for the invitation to participate in this forum. Uh, having listened to some of the interventions before, uh, like uh, Richard, I would agree with most of what has been said. So let me zero in on some of the aspects that I think are specific to Africa. Uh, the fact that Africa lags in terms of industrial uh, uh, manufacturing in particular, uh, with about 2% uh, contribution to the, the world uh, uh, to the world output uh, tells a story. And the story is basically that we haven't changed much from the colonial times where African uh, territories were used for basically exporting uh, raw uh, materials that uh, enabled the industrialization of other regions, particularly the, richer, uh, the richest uh, industrialized countries today. And when we look into the composition of trade uh, for Africa nowadays, we have not changed that picture. And I, I believe that uh, this is just uh, something that is more, much more complex than throwing uh, the discussion of industrial policy and what you need to do right and so on. It is systemic. And it could have been actually the same story if we looked into uh, carbon emissions, it would have been the same story if we looked into how the access to finance has been uh, evolving, could have been the same story about intellectual property. So we have some systemic reasons why this continues to be so. And some of these reasons, I believe, are now going to actually enter a new stage of the same. Uh, because when you look into how the transitions are being discussed in terms of uh, the acceleration, uh, that is required, particularly in, in, in terms of um, energy um, matrix and also uh, mobility, you will realize that Africans are being seen and perceived by most as uh, possible contributors of uh, the strategic minerals and also the uh, energy potential of green hydrogen, in particular in Africa, is the largest in the world, and so forth. So we, we have these uh, characteristics uh, that are very much in contradiction, almost like in paradox, with the proclamations about you know, trying to help Africa. I've counted 32 uh, African initiatives in Europe alone over the last decade and a half, and continues to have a new initiative every year. And uh, I think we have really run the course in terms of trying to address these issues through uh, development aid on one hand and also sort of the proposals that come with it in terms of uh, goodwill, uh, very nice words, and uh, also the participation of Africa in these different universal processes that are not respectful of the key principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. So I think the time has come for Africa really to exercise some agency. And in, in so doing, it has an, a number of advantages uh, of being a latecomer because it has not participated in the production of uh, the trajectory that has produced the emissions that we are now 
confronted with that are an emergency for the planet. So it can jump into latest technology and uh, be sure of basically in terms of its infrastructure uh, and acquiring what is really necessary. But the impediment number one is going to be obviously uh, the systemic uh, reasons that I mentioned. So let's go one by one with the key ones. Uh, on trade, as uh, Jeffrey rightly pointed out, although the discussions are not being openly uh, uh, um, tabled at WTO, we have already entered a new stage of trade where in the name of uh, greening, we are going to introduce measures that are going to be basically protective. Uh, we have the, the case of CBAM in Europe that is supposed to be about you know, promoting green um, uh, approaches to uh, the imports of the European Union. But in fact, uh, in studies that uh, have been made uh, in Africa, you know, the Africans will be the most penalized. And the compensation is to say we are going to give some climate finance money, and we know what that story is about because you know we've been listening to uh, these promises for quite some time. Um, and you have the IRA also in the United States is going the same in the same direction. So we have to be much more clear about the fact that Africa needs to have uh, participation in some of the international fora. Uh, uh, of a different way than it is right now. Um, it's a must to be in the G20, obviously. It makes a lot of sense to have more than just the African Union. Uh, uh, South Africa is a member, but you know it's not the largest economy in the continent. Depending on the, which indicators you use, uh, certainly Nigeria and Egypt should qualify to be also there. Um, and then you have the issue of intellectual property. That is my second biggest concern because you have regimes that have been uh, developed over time to compensate the industrialization of OECD countries uh, with you know, more value uh, pushed in the direction of uh, uh, patents and intellectual uh, property. And now Africa is confronted with you know, no exceptionalisms and uh, we have seen it during the pandemic. This is penalizing the possibilities of in, uh, introducing industrial development in the continent in areas that are strategic, we need a different treatment. And this is very much in line with common but differentiated responsibilities. And last but not least is the issue of finance. Uh, in the issue of finance, we basically saw that the instruments that are there for confronting the kind of uh, multipolar uh, world that we are entering uh, into in terms of uh, um, um, the, um, the, 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 the hopes uh, for uh, addressing global public goods is, is, is becoming more and more distant. And we have uh, the, the, the possibilities of entering into a geopolitical tension level where you know, basically the African countries are being asked to choose sides very quickly in terms of whether they will be have, having access to certain types of support. And I think the Africans want to navigate this more with pragmatic lens and trying to see how for the acceleration of their industrialization process, which is fundamental uh, need in terms of the, the, the employment requirements of the continent that is the youngest, uh, they, they, will, they will have to you know, basically count uh, friends in terms of those who are going to allow for this transformation to take place. Structural transformation has been given too much weight in terms of what you can do in terms of your industrial policy at the national level. I'm uh, basically pointing in the direction that some of the systemic issues uh, are so overwhelming that even if you have good industrial policies, you are not likely to succeed unless there is really a respect of the common but differentiated uh, responsibilities. We have not been part of the emissions problem. We have not benefited from uh, the trajectory of growth of the last centuries. And therefore, you know, it's just a matter of uh, recognizing that the inequality levels that we have attained today are uh, absolutely incompatible with the transformations that we are talking about. There will be no uh, green world. There will be no transitions uh, that make sense if we don't address issues of inequality uh, at this level and Africa very much being at the receiving end of most of the problems will require a completely different treatment than just being the recipient of goodwill and the recipient of aid.
Thank you, Professor Lopez. I can only say from my perspective and the work I do, there's a huge hope in the young entrepreneurs and the potential that Africa is deploying right now in terms of innovation and creating uh, uh, really uh, fantastic ideas and, and uh, companies. Um, moving to, um, to Ms. Ghosh, uh, I would like to uh, ask her a question and, and basically in your experience, what does the evidence tell us? What can countries do to make digitalization of industry consistent with job creation? Thus far, what is the experience of, for example, labor intensive countries in Asia and other parts of the, of the world? Ms. Ghosh? There's a sense in which many developing countries already feel overwhelmed by even trying to do industrial policy simply because the obstacles seem so large and almost impossible to penetrate. So first of all, there is the fear that the new industrial revolution will actually alter the possibilities of industrial policy and the role of manufacturing in generating employment. I think there's no question that that is the case that industrialization is critical still, it's very important and it's necessary for developing countries, but it will not generate employment. And that is something that we should recognize, but it doesn't mean that our, all our options are closed. In other words, we really have to think of a double-pronged strategy. Industrialization is essential because of the synergies it generates, because of the technological progress and innovation, because of the fact that you cannot really advance and have economic progress now without engaging in the really hard stuff of making things. At the same time, however, it doesn't mean that you have to rely on industrialization to generate employment. We do have to think of employment generating strategies that are also part of a broader green transition program. Particularly, I'm thinking of much greater public investment in the care and creative industries. Care activities in particular are undervalued by the market, are undervalued by society. And it's important to actually recognize the significance of care, the economic significance of care, quite apart from the welfare significance. And it's huge employment generating potential. The more you invest in health and education, the more you generate more employment, which has very positive multiplier effects. And these are activities that are aided by technology, but not in fact, uh, removed by technology, particularly care activities, you can't replace the relational element, the human element, and that's critical for the future. So we need to invest much more in care, along with recognizing the needs for significant industrial policies for the green transition. With respect to the green transition, we clearly need international cooperation. It's not going to happen without that. We know it's necessary for finance to enable the requisite public and private finance for the massive investments that are required. We know it's necessary in terms of relieving countries of the debt stress. Currently about 70 countries are in moderate or severe or extreme debt stress. And many others are quite soon going to fall into that particular position. We need to relieve that debt stress. We need to ensure that knowledge is not privatized, that there is in fact a possibility of all countries to access the required technologies, the required knowledge for effecting a reasonable and sustainable green transition and for ensuring that there is enough access for production all over the world. Because otherwise we won't get a green transition. It's as simple as that. And we need international cooperation for tax purposes because fiscal constraints of governments are so large that they cannot be met with current levels of very, very low and sometimes non-existent wealth taxation and inadequate taxation of multinational corporations. There are ways of doing this and we can, in fact, do these effectively. But for all of these, international cooperation is clearly essential. And until we ensure that the global economy and the advanced economies in particular recognize this, we're not going to get a green transition at all. Forget about a just or equitable one. We will not get the required climate mitigation or adaptation that is necessary for our people and our planet. Thank you very much, Ms. Scotch. Uh, technical issues. 
Um, and uh, we will then move to uh, Mr. Uh, Perez and, and look at the situation in Latin America. And the question is, from your perspective of Latin America, what is missing in terms of the innovation performance? What kind of initiatives would help in addressing this challenge in Latin America? And what can developing countries in Africa, the Arab region, and Asia learn from the experience of LAC? Mr. Perez? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much to UNIDO for inviting me to this excellent panel. And uh, I'm very happy because this is the first panel I participate after I retired from the UN system last month. And actually, my first position 32 years ago in the system was in the then ECLAC UNIDO Industrial and Technological Development Unit. And 32 years later, we find that industrial and technological policy, industrial and technological development continue to, continues to be in the fore of our debate. I will concentrate only on two issues. First, I will try to present which are the main problems of uh, Latin American industrialization uh, on basically the use of industrial policy in Latin America. And second, how we move forward. First, I can make a, a long speech about Latin American problems, but I would say that related with industrial policy, the main problem is what we may call implementation failures. We design too many projects, we design too many programs and plans, and actually implementation is extremely poor and sometimes never happens. For instance, it's just is an issue not of the smallest countries in the region, but of all countries, of almost all countries in the region. So the first question is why this implementation failure? And I would say there are two or three causes of this implementation failure. First, we do not have what we may call agencies that are policy operators. On one hand, we have agencies that design policy. On the other hand, we have agencies or firms that implement policies. Impl design and implementation, there is a huge divide between them. And what we found, for, for instance, in the case of your question about technological policies. Technological policies are usually designed by agencies, sometimes at the presidential level or the ministerial level, with some input from input from academia. Okay, you publish the plan. Who implements a plan of technology? Universities. Universities are usually and happily autonomous. Co laboratories of large corporations, sometimes state-owned corporations, sometimes private domestic corporations, and sometimes multinational corporations. So we have agencies that, that cannot send the strong signal you need for implementation at the real level. Second point, something that I, I think is extremely important, we have too many shopping lists of what to do. You take the case of any country in the region and you find that we have to promote 10 sectors, 15 sectors, sometimes you even have another the other sector so we have huge shopping lists and most of, um, and we have also shopping lists not when not only when we speak about sectoral policies but also when we speak about horizontal policies we need policies for a small and medium-sized enterprise we need technology we need um, labor we need employment we need digital so the issue is we have failed both the academia and international organizations, and I would add government, having some idea of how to prioritize. We cannot continue having plans that are not implemented because you, we have the tens or even dozens of sec priority sectors or priority uh, horizontal policies. And third, I would say that uh, another problem is the fact that sometimes because of trying to follow best practices, we tend to design policies that are extremely, extremely complex and that the 
capabilities of the agencies in, this, in those countries cannot uh, implement those policies. Complexity in a, a policy is almost always a way to ensure that that policies will not be implemented. So I would say there are many other problems, but I would say that this fact that we do not have a policy operator, we have a lot of shopping lists of policies, and we design sometimes policies that are good for some developed regions, for instance, in Europe, that are not, uh, are not implementable in Latin America. But what can we do? we do? I think that we can learn a lot from a policy that has been extremely successful in Latin America. That is the policy to, the policy to build up infrastructure for broadband internet connection. Latin America has been very, very successful in, in that sense. And I think that we have to learn of those policies. What are the lessons? I would let the lessons. I, I would say there are four lessons. First lesson, those policies have stable decision-making teams that were highly qualified. So that is difficult, but it's clear that without a stable decision-making decision teams that are highly qualified, we cannot move toward giving the right signals to business to over where to invest and how and what uh, on what to invest. Second, then they had always a sense of mission. It's not the same concept of Mariana Mazzucato, but I think it's compatible. You remember the mantra of ICT in the 1990s. We are here not to make money, we are here to change the world. Most of the policy makers that were involved in the expansion of internet and broadband internet in Latin America had that idea. We are here for something, something, and that something is that we have to create a new world through our technology, through what we are doing. The third point, and I think is extremely important, despite um, in, um, the technology be, being homogeneous, uh, uh, homogeneous uh, across countries, we, we have this, the policy implementation was very sensitive to the cultural and political differences among countries. For instance, take one case. In the case of Uruguay, 10 or 15 years uh, ago, when the policy began, would be, it would have been extremely difficult to have internet expansion via or by means of investment of a transnational corporation. In other countries, just the opposite. In some countries, it would, be, would have been impossible to think to expand the internet via state-owned enterprises as happened, enterprise happened in Uruguay. So policies were very sensitive to the political and, to the, and more than the political, to the cultural environment of the countries. And finally, I would say, that there was a fourth factor that has been that was important is the issue that policy makers always play with technological progress. They were in favor of technological progress and they sent a very clear message: we have to change, we have to incorporate these technologies, or we will have a very bad future. So I would say we have a problem of implementation. And, but we have a, case, a successful case, there are others, no? but I have a successful case in which if you have something like motivation, you have confidence in technological progress, you respect the differences among countries, and you have an idea that, that you, you, and you have a good, a, a stable and highly qualified decision-making teams, you can make a difference. So I, I tried uh, to present this, perhaps in the second uh, turn of questions, uh, I could go more in detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Perez. And it's uh, definitely uh, an idea is worthless unless implemented and execution is key. Um, so uh, Mr. Zhu, what does this revival of industrial policy mean for UNIDO? And how can the organization support the efforts of its member states to accelerate industrialization and progress towards the achievements of the SDGs? 
Thank you, thank you, uh, Sema, for this important question. Good afternoon, esteemed panel and uh, fellow uh, participants. The world uh, has entered a new era of energy policy. UNIDO is well aware of the significance of this transition in the global landscape. So as the United Nations Agency specializes in industrial development, UNIDO aims to spearhead the debate on this transition by providing a platform to discuss a new industrial strategy agenda for all countries, which needs to be green, fair, and resilient. We are convinced that the revival of industrial policy is essential for addressing today's grand challenge at a time when global economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis has risk due to renewed geopolitical tensions, armed conflicts, and the escalating climate emergency, industry can indeed serve as a key driver of social economic development, job creation, and a reduction in hunger. UNIDO seeks to accelerate the transition towards a responsible industrial transformation in the context of three mega trends. So in Professor Sect's kind of, kind of introduction, the disruptive forces, basically you need to select them more or less in line with your assessment that are changing the industrial landscape. First, digitalization and automation. Second, industrial greening. And the third, global production repurposing. <laughs> so different language, but more or less by nature the same. Huh? Through our programs and initiatives, we promote the development of sustainable and inclusive industrial development by supporting member states uh, in the design and the implementation of effective industrial strategies. One of UNIDO's top priorities is to assist the member states in achieving a smooth digital trans transition based on technology transfer, e-commerce tools, enterprise management practices, and capacity development. We are currently developing a strategic framework called Making the Fourth Industrial Revolution Work for All to boost the national innovation ecosystem and reduce the digital divide. So first to a green transition, UNIDO aims to expand global access to green technologies. The organization leverages its expertise in renewable energy, circular economy, decarbonization, and emission reduction to unlock opportunities for resilient carbon neutral growth. Our approach builds on technology transfers in cleaner and resource efficient production on providing education and training and designing green industrial policies. UNIDO is also committed to increasing the competitiveness of industries in developing countries to enable their integration up and upgrading in global regional supply chains. We aim to raise the quality of their manufacturing products and their compliance with market requirements by facilitating capacity and trade-related quality infrastructure building. Thereby, we need to support small and medium enterprises in becoming more competitive and to participate in local, regional, and global value chains. For all of our efforts to pay off, however, countries need to have a solid industry strategies and uh, policy in place, as both uh, Pro Professor Sachs and also a representative from Arctic they highlight the extreme importance of having this long-term plan and the strategic planning. So UNIDO therefore also supports countries in designing and implementing their industrial strategies. Our approach builds on the development of capacities on the ground and on collaborating with member states and partners to design and implement the state-of-the-art evidence-based industrial policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zoom. <laughs> On the importance of the role of UNIDO, and thank you for convening this big event and bringing us together. Um, I would like now to go to a second round of questions, but I would kindly ask all of the speakers to really keep it short, as short as possible. Uh, we have had the fantastic insights already now, and uh, we would love to have a lot of uh, other discussion, but uh, we are, well, we had some great insights. We are not there yet at the questions. I'm sorry, just one more thing. Uh, the second round, then I would like to ask Mr. Professor Sachs, what uh, mechanisms can the global community use to broaden policy space and investment opportunities? to facilitate the green transition so that the developing countries can accelerate industrialization in ways consistent with decarbonization of production. <laughs> I 
think there are two categories <coughs> that are most important. One is practical financing. Uh, as I emphasized uh, earlier, at least the poorer countries in the world do not have access to the quality of financing needed for this transformation. And how to solve that is unsolved, except that we know that one set of institutions is important in this, and that's the multilateral development banks. If you add up what the World Bank and the regional development banks lend each year, the total is a little over $100 billion a year for everything, not just for energy, for everything. This is probably one-tenth or less of what is really needed right now. So banks like the Inter-American Development Bank or the African Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank simply operate at far too low a scale because they are crucial for providing long-term development finance, but they do very little of it. Think about the following. The African Development Bank, which is the core development finance institution for 1.4 billion people in 54 countries, has an annual loan flow of $12 billion. This is ridiculous. And it should be 10 times larger than that minimum, especially for the lowest capitalized part of the planet. So this is where I would put immediate emphasis. The problem is, practically speaking, for these banks to do more, they need more paid in capital. The paid in capital comes from the high income countries. The United States does not favor this in general. And Europe probably will plead that it can't do this either. And in the U.S. case, one of the main reasons is that the U.S. doesn't want more paid in capital because China would then get a larger vote in these institutions. So my recommendation is that if the U.S. won't do it, a coalition of countries that want to do it should go ahead and do it because we shouldn't be held back by one country. We really need the Inter-American Development Bank, the Latin American Development Fund, the COF, the uh, African Development Bank, and so on, to be operating at a much, much larger scale. I emphasize finance because I deal with finance ministers every day. And all that we're talking about stops with the finance minister who says, I can't. I don't have what to do. I can't put in more money in the budget. I'm not even allowed to borrow more under the terms of my IMF agreement. The whole thing is incoherent, actually, because we need much larger financing. A final point that I would emphasize in general, <laughs> it's just so weird. Where did the $100 billion a year number come from? Hillary Clinton said it in Copenhagen in 2009. She said, by 2020, the developing country, developed countries will guarantee at least $100 billion. Two things should be noted about that. One, the number came out of thin air. There was no basis for it. Second, of course, it wasn't even close to being achieved because nobody worked hard to achieve it, especially not the United States. So the number came. The rich countries give their own report card, by the way, at the OECD. They score how much they're giving. Even when they fake their own report card, they couldn't get up to $100 billion. So recently, we had a new important agreement on biodiversity. The Kunming Montreal Agreement. Very good. But it says there that financing will be, I think it's 25 billion a year for developing countries. 
What? $25 billion. That's Elon Musk's breakfast. Where do these numbers come from? Could somebody do grown-up work? What is supposed to be needed? What is the gaps? What needs financing? Because this is what we're doing. We're playing games right now with the planet. We make up numbers. They don't get achieved. And so I want to emphasize the financing because as an economist, I follow the money. And without the money, we can't do this. With the money, a lot of innovative things would be done, by the way. When countries have access to financing, they think about what to do about their future. So much more could happen. So that would be my, my, main, uh, my, my main point of emphasis. There are a lot of other things. Actually, let me say one more thing, if I might. In addition to being nice to your neighbors and having them over for a cup of coffee, the other thing I would really, really, really recommend as the number one goal of every society, bar none, is educate your children. Because you can't have a technological revolution with a population that's poorly educated. And this is not happening right now. And it's the most basic thing. Look at your child. You want them to know everything they could know. Think of all the other children in the society. Get them into school with proper resources. Nothing could be more important fundamentally than this, because you cannot be at the cutting edge of technology if the kids are not graduating high school and if they're not numerate. And so this is the other most basic point. It's neglected, by the way, almost everywhere. It's the craziest thing in my 40 years of development experience, how little emphasized proper education is. So I just wanted to put that on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor Sachs. Uh, that is one of the big things, is education, and we see a terrible uh, digital divide that is happening right now with artificial intelligence and uh, the developments there. And um, we would like to ask uh, the, the following speakers to really keep your answers, if possible, to a two minutes. <laughs> Um, Mr. Kozel Wright, considering that developing countries are currently facing a poly, a poly crisis, simultaneously confronting challenges on the economic, social, and environmental fact fronts, as we've heard, what roles can the industrial policy play in addressing these challenges, and how can the international community support this process? I know this is a big question, but maybe we can have one short answer. Okay, let me be as short as I can. Um, I mean, Jeff is right about long-term financing. I mean, developing countries also need short-term financing, liquidity financing, and the mechanisms we have at the international level are also insufficient. I mean, the comparison that we've seen over the last week between, between the short-term financing that has been found to stabilize banks in the United States and, and Europe compared with the short-term financing available to developing countries in, dis in distress is quite staggering. 300 billion has been found by the United States in response to the uh, Silicon Valley bank crisis. Uh, developing countries in the last um, allocation of special drawing rights last year received something like $200 billion for the, I think, if you exclude China, probably, for, you know, a group of countries that represent 2 billion uh, people uh, plus. So, I mean, these also need for short-term liquidity financing and mechanisms at the multilateral level certainly need to be improved in that respect. Uh, uh, I, I would, again, education, health are critical in terms of uh, uh, meeting these needs. Many developing countries do not have the resources, partly because they are spending more on servicing their debts than they are on either health or education. And the debt problem in developing countries and the need to strengthen the architecture to allow developing countries to work through their debt problems is a, is a urgent uh, challenge for the international community. The current system, whether through the IMF, the G20 or the Paris Club is clearly insufficient to deal with the stresses that developing countries face 
uh, in terms of their debt positions, and UNCTAD has long argued the need for some sort of multilateral mechanism to, proper, to properly deal with uh, sovereign debt restructuring. We would make, we are making that case now. We will continue to make it as developing countries are gonna face more stresses over, over the coming year as the global economy uh, begins to wobble again. And, and finally, in terms of just to repeat the need for some sort of reform of the international trading uh, architecture, I think, I think the rules of the game clearly are working against developing countries adopting the kinds of industrial policies that we've been talking about uh, this afternoon. And, and I think the need to re revisit that, those rules is critical if we're going to restore trust in the international trading system. And, tr and the loss of trust, I think, over the course of the last few years in the international rules of the game is a serious obstacle to making progress on the sustainable development goals and and the climate agenda and, and so finding ways to restore that trust is, is imperative i think thanks thank you mr kozorel and thank you for keeping it short uh, professor lopez um, if there is one thing that you could say in your perspective what role can regional integration and regional policy alignment play in supporting africa's industrial development well, uh, of course, uh, Africa, with its continent of free trade, that is trying to move in the direction of integrating its economies as much as possible, but it's a long road. And I think um, the, the conditions are not always favorable. If you look into you know, the protocols that are under discussion right now, they are in the confluence of trade and industrial policy. And that's why the, there are some difficulties with countries that have already established capacity and are very much afraid uh, of a certain number of developments that may condition their own development. Uh, slowly, this uh, position is being overcome. Uh, and the more we discuss about the environmental dimensions, the more enticing it will be for Africa to to, to, to come together for, for, for negotiations at a global level. Normally you get what, what you negotiate, not what is just. This is a fight. Trade is always a fight. If you look into the emissions from Africa, uh, which are, the, as we know, very low, about 3% in, of the global emissions, uh, about 30 to 40% comes from manufacturing. And uh, if you look into a bit more uh, detail, you will realize that 75% of those emissions are coming from four economies, South Africa, Egypt, uh, Algeria, and Nigeria. And so uh, we have to basically have uh, a major transition in these countries if you are going to have uh, the potential to take advantage of uh, green industrialization and not be a provider of commodities without value addition, as I've mentioned before. But the odds are not in favor. Uh, even if these uh, four countries are taking into account, you have immense difficulties in accessing markets. The issues of liquidity are serious for a number of countries. The uh, um, depreciation of their currencies is quite uh, amazing over the last uh, three years. Um, it continues to accelerate. And I, I think uh, you have basically a behavior that has uh, been now considered as normal for, for instance, the rating agencies, classifying projects uh, uh, in, in terms of the sovereign rating of the country, not really the value of the, the project itself. You have metrics that are applied to environmental projects that don't make sense. For instance, adaptation is a very difficult uh, metrics uh, in general. So there is a, uh, an attempt to basically take refuge by dealing with mitigation uh, more, than, uh, more than adaptation, which is where uh, you know, Africa could make a real difference. So you have all these characteristics that are pointing in the direction of uh, multilateral action, and when when we when we look into what has been promised over and over, and what has been delivered, uh, one has to recognize that there is a, a deficit of trust. 
that deficit of trust is becoming really a gulf. And uh, it's going to be extremely difficult to uh, convince um, any given group of countries from the low income segment that some of the, the narratives and some of the promises uh, make sense. So they will have to find a way and and one one of the one of the manifestations of agency in so far as Africa is concerned is precisely the momentum that the Africa continental free trade area has taken uh, as a demonstration of you know looking more into internal possibilities of a larger African market. Thank you, Professor Lopez, and it is about this integration of the policy. Uh, Mr. Perez, um, how do you think can regional integration and really knowledge sharing within a region contribute to industrialization efforts? Uh, possibly a one and a half bit, minute answer? Yes, <laughs> okay, I understand. Well, uh, actually, uh, we have uh, recently a very important experience in Latin America. There was the design of a program to increase self sufficiency in the production of vaccine and uh, other pharmaceutical. And that program was designed in 2021. And I have uh, two or three lessons out of that program. First, the program was presented to the Latin American uh, uh, community, uh, Latin American and Caribbean community of uh, uh, states, uh, in Spanish called CELAC. But there was clearly a leader in this process. There was the government of Mexico being the pro tempore president of that uh, community. So we had a case in which we presented some ideas that were easily, or not so easily, but, but fastly implemented, and that was moved by one country. Second, the second point is we started implementation almost immediately. So we didn't spend much, much more than two or three months to design the program, and implementation began something like one month after the, the, the states of the region approved that program. But thirdly, a problem arose. There is the extreme heterogeneity of countries in the region. For instance, we tried to work with a regulation agencies, and we found that some countries had very good regulation agencies, other countries had almost nothing. So I would say they will try to complement some of the ideas uh, presented by Professor Sachs. That is, cooperate with your neighbor, but in the case of Latin America, to cooperate in total, may, maybe politically is possible. But economically, we have to go to the, through the sub-regional integration system. It's very difficult to have something homogeneous across the, the countries in the region, but we have to work through uh, the sub-regional systems, for instance, Mercosur, for instance, Pacific Alliance, for instance, uh, Central American Common Market, for instance, Caribbean Community. And, what, and I finish with this, the idea that we need always a leader. The leadership of Mexico was later was taken by Argentina. There was the, pres the, the president of CELAC, and now the president is in St. Vincent and the Granadines. So I would say implementation is possible, is not easy, but go for the sub-regional integration system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Yes, go for sub-regional uh, alignment. And Mr. Zhu, Mr. Zhu um, um, finishing this session, um, in your experience, what role can a global forum such as MIPF play in accelerating countries' progress towards the achievement of the SDGs, and how can we ensure value addition in the area of industrial development within the framework of the forum? And again, a one and a half minute answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think you need to, we believe that uh, accelerating is accelerating the key to it achieving progress towards a more sustainable, equitable, and prosperous future for all, but we cannot achieve this on our own. So industrial development requires coordinated strategies that are guided by innovation to achieve progress. We need a new mechanisms for partnerships, collaboration, and exchange, so the best men, men can share knowledge and ideas. This was the rationale behind establishing this multilateral industrial policy forum, namely 
to facilitate international coordination and dialogue around industry policy issues. It serves as a platform for the exchange of experiences and knowledge and provides interactive learning sessions to discuss and analyze analysts, uh, several countries' cases on specific industrial policy topics. Our ultimate goal is to promote mutual learning and knowledge sharing among countries and the stakeholders. Of course, from United side, we expect that this forum also will provide us an opportunity to understand better the, 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 the uh, priorities of member states and also some maybe good, good solutions that we could also say use to uh, so support in those other member states. So of course this forum will help us improve our analytic and normative and action oriented research functions and the policy advisory services to accelerate the progress towards the SDGs. So in a nutshell, our intended outcome for this year's edition of the MPF is to gain a better understanding of new approaches to industrial policy and to foster collaboration to address global challenges together. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhu. A better understanding of the needs and how to do that, absolutely. And um, we are running late, and we have had a fantastic, insightful inputs from all the speakers. But uh, if there is an urgent question, we might take one or two questions for any of the speakers that are still available. Unfortunately, Mr. Sachs had to leave. Uh, but the other speakers, yes? <coughs> yeah, thank you. It's a very simple question, yeah, an operational one. Um, a very simple request to the uh, Secretariat. It would be really kind uh, if you could share as soon as possible the minutes or uh, even better the record of uh, today's discussion. Uh, because um, um, I'm not sure we, we, we fully understood some of the enlightening concept expressed today. Um, for example, that, that one by Mr. Sachs regarding collaboration between neighbors. Um, and I'm sure that also in my capital, and not only in my capital, probably there is a huge interest uh, towards this uh, such um, high geopolitical subscription. Um, so it's very important to have, uh, as soon as possible, this, this put for thought. Also having a look to forthcoming discussion in UNIDO, uh, for example, that one regarding the budget. So uh, please uh, share with us the minutes or better the full records of today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, and it will be forwarded to the people that will be able to answer and um, uh, go. I don't think we will have a comment now, but uh, you will be receiving, I'm sure, all the information that was requested. And any other comment? Well, um, thank you very much for your comment and uh, it's been really insightful and um, it's been a, a really a pleasure for me to, to be here. It was uh, great to have you all on board and definitely a lot of discussion that is needed uh, different opinions, different approaches, different countries and different needs that we have here. I would like to thank all the speakers, um, everybody here in the room and everybody who is online listening to us. And of the um, special thanks uh, from my side and, and in general goes to the event organizing team of the Multilateral Industrial Policy Forum. I think they need, uh, they can get a round of applause for organizing all of this. And um, I hope you have enjoyed this session, as Mr. Zhu said at the end, it's a, it, it is about a better understanding where we're heading, but it's a great, great pleasure to see that the forum is also enabling additional actions and additional transfer of knowledge and averaging the participation, as there are two meetings, one from Latin America and one uh, the Latin American member states will discuss industrial policy in the case, um, and this is also co-organized by GRULAC and UNIDO's Bureau for Latin American Region. And another one is happening on Wednesday, the expert group meeting for 2023 High-Level Policy Forum thematic review of the SDG 9. 
organized by UNIDO and U uh, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Let me remind you that um, the official program will continue tom tomorrow at 10. And um, from my side, it has been a pleasure and an honor to be here today with you, coming from a business side and coming from a startup world, seeing this uh, high level, meta level story and uh, approaches has been really rewarding and I'm very uh, happy to be here. Thank you very much. Enjoy your stay in Vienna if you are here and enjoy your evening wherever you are. See you tomorrow. <laughs>